PPP and the soul of free market liberalism. The Payroll Protection Plan is a 2020 government program available to uh, businesses and organizations primarily in response to the economic damage done by COVID-19 slowdown, shutdowns, and, and lockdowns. What drew me into this issue uh, was that uh, many of the free market liberal organizations that uh, I, I follow, in some cases I'm involved with, uh, were debating the merits and demerits of accepting government funding. And of course, uh, as, uh, as organizations that are in favor of limited government and don't believe in government redistribution of wealth, subsidies, tax breaks, and so on. I was uh, interested to find that there was a pretty lively debate about the uh, this particular program. And so I was watching some uh, uh, anarcho-libertarians debate it on a social media page. Also some uh, conservative free marketers, a little bit later some objectivists and some classical liberal organizations as well. Uh, some of these were public discussions on social media, but I also was uh, privy to some internal discussion involving two organizations that I uh, that I participate in. So on the basis of uh, following those arguments, and then uh, I, I tracked as a matter of research interest what many of these organizations decide and uh, to whether to accept the PPP funds or not. And I made a list of uh, 15 organizations, and it turned out that 13 of them uh, decided not to take PPP funds funding, but two did. What was interesting to me was that, well, you know, lots of good points that were uh, being made in favor of taking PPP and many good points against taking it for sure, but I found myself uh, dissatisfied overall with the with the public arguments, uh, that I didn't think a complete case had been made, and that there was, was, as usual, a lot of talking past that was going on. So here I want to focus just on the propriety of PPP, but it is a particular government program and it raises issues more broadly of government funding programs and wealth redistribution and uh, emergency situations as, as well. Now, I think that for me, the big question is how one does ethics, uh, both theoretically and practically, in a world in which there's lots of compromise and corruption. And then more specifically, when uh, one is striving to retain a sense of integrity and appropriateness and flourish in a mixed e political economy. Uh, and then even more specifically with respect to a particular government program. So we can scale up and down, say there's lots of compromise and corruption in the world. How do we deal with that and other individuals? We can then narrow it to political economic concerns, and then we can narrow it to particular government programs. But the point is that when one is dealing with other people who are compromised or corrupt or in a system that has a significant amount of compromise and corruption in it, or a government program that involves uh, a, a forcible taking and redistribution that's necessarily a corrupted or mixed program, it complicates the application of what are normally healthy principles, and we should expect that people will be pulled in different directions in dealing with uh, the same particular program. So, uh, you know, I'm tempted you know, when I've seen some of the online discussions uh, you know, say that I'm observing some free market uh, liberals or libertarians or objectivists uh, uh, arguing about to say what we really have is a kind of contemporary version of that old mind-body split, right? Should you go with your soul or should you go with your with what's practical? Should you keep your, your principles intact or should you uh, be a successful and flourish right in the in the world and uh, one side then accuses the other of lacking integrity because it's taking the PPP funding and the other side responds by saying oh no no only a martyr right would reject taking the PPP funding one side effect is saying you know to those who took the money hey you're corrupting your soul for money and the other side saying of those who did not take the money oh you're just sacrificing yourself for some impractical principle. Now, I don't think either of those types of accusations is correct, and I think they are incorrect because of what's built into corrupt systems and that it's not simply a matter of some abstract general principles that can be applied mechanically. So I want to just say a few preparatory words about these two issues. You know, It is the nature of corrupted systems to put moral principles rather in conflict right, with each other. So, 
For example, you know, normally there's no tension between being a truth-telling person and being committed to protecting innocent people. But then a bad person comes along and tries to get information out of you that is going to be used against you or some other, other in, innocent people. Then a conflict arises and uh, two of your normal principles are put in tension with each other. So does my being a truth-teller or my protecting innocent people uh, uh, have precedence in this particular case. So it seems like I could tell a lie and protect the innocent person, right? or I can tell the truth and let harm come to that person. Now, that's a relatively simple case, just involving a couple of principles, and I think it's uh, pretty clear that, at least to me, uh, you know, lying in that case is uh, pretty much always appropriate. But uh, there are much more complicated uh, cases where it's not just two principles, normal principles that are put in tension, but several principles that are put in tension. So uh, when we find ourselves in what we know to be a complicated, compromised, corrupted system, uh, we can't just say, or we should be very on our guard against saying, here's one important principle, say justice, or don't be a martyr, or have integrity, and that's it. That's it. That's the only principle operative. Instead, what we need to do is to identify the several principles that are operative, recognize that they are being put in tension by the situation that we are put our, finds ourselves in, and we have to make an argument about which of those principles is going to take precedence and why. And there are, in some cases, inescapably, in mixed economies and in corrupted societies, going to be trade-offs that you have to make. Second point is that, as with most moral issues, it's not a matter only of abstract general principles. And then once you've identified them, you can apply them uh, kind of rationalistically and universally. I know rationalistically in this context is, uh, is fighting words, but there is an occupational hazard uh, about how we apply general principles to particular cases. And the point is that in many cases, there's inside knowledge and particularized values that need to be changed taken into account, and particularly when we're judging another person or another organization, we will need a lot more information beyond just uh, having identified some general principles in play. And I think both of those apply to PPP decision making. So it's in a you know, corrupted political economic context. So we should go into this expecting that there will be principles in tension or in outright conflict. And we have to know a particular individual or organization very well how it came to its decision before judging. Are you looking for a new book to dive into? Then check out audiobooks.com. With over 150,000 premium titles, they have an incredible selection of books to get stuck into, whatever your genre of preference. Listening to audiobooks makes reading incredibly easy and enjoyable. Not only do you have instant access to thousands of titles, but powerful narrators can bring the text to life, often giving a book more meaning than just flicking through the pages itself. Do more with audiobooks and start your next book while multitasking, doing the laundry, taking a drive, going for a walk, doing exercise or something else. With audiobooks, you can even read your books with your eyes closed. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial and get three audiobooks completely free. Go to www.audiobooks.com and click sign up to get started. And please help support the podcast by entering our promo code, Open College, which is all one word. Fall in love with books again with audiobooks.com. And while you're online, please show your support for the podcast by leaving a view on your favorite media player. Now back to the podcast. So far uh, online in the last couple of weeks, I've uh, posted a few preparatory items to the what I think of the kind of thinking that a decider would have to, uh, to engage with. I've not yet stated my position publicly, partly because I've been uh, working through it myself, but I have uh, publicly poked at some underdeveloped arguments, several overstatements, and, uh, and pointed in the direction of some issues that I don't think uh, have yet been considered. So, so far online, I've uh, at my website, put a general framing of the issue, an 11-point analogy, kind of an, an analytical table to help clarify some things, and then some literary sense-of-life type examples to, uh, to mull over. 
And I'll put the links to those in the, the transcript for, for this podcast. And also, I want to say uh, in, in these preparatory remarks that uh, in both public remarks so far, I haven't named any individuals or organizations. And in this podcast, I'm going to continue to do so. And my reasons for that are, are a couple of fold. One is that I'm interested here in the principles and the applications. There are some very general issues about identifying moral principles in this kind of context and how to do practical moral thinking in such context. And that is what my my focus on. And so uh, what I find, of course, and of course, we all run into this uh, online and in other kinds of discussions, naming individuals and organizations is often a, a distraction. And it just puts certain people on the defensive. It incites all sorts of, you know, ad hominems and, and tribalisms and all kinds of bad histories emerge and it just turns into a food fight. So whatever particular organizations in the free market liberal broad universe that uh, one is aware of or interested in or loyal to, try to see this not as a kind of a New York Yankees versus Boston Red Sox kind of issue. You might be a fan of a particular team. You might dislike the other team, but set that aside. This is not, that's not the right level to pitch these issues. It's uh, more of uh, kind of a, a major league baseball issue. So you imagine yourself as a commissioner of Major League Baseball. How would you think about a particular issue in baseball? Or even better, kicking it up another level of abstraction, that this is more of a sports ethics issue in general. It's not even about baseball in in particular. So please set aside any, uh, you know, diehard Yankees fan sentiments or I hate the Yankees feelings. And let's focus on the broader issues of excellence in baseball and sports ethics. Let's approach this as moral philosophers and political philosophers. So in conclusion, with all of that preparatory stuff, what do I think about taking PPP? And I want to uh, narrow the context of decision making to being kind of a, a free market liberal organization in general. There's lots of them and they have their differences, but that's the level of abstraction. I think it's appropriate to pitch it here. Now, what that means, though, uh, and this also has come up in, in some of the online discussion, you know, as people are considering all sorts of analogies, but we can, uh, you know, when we consider analogies in, rele- in similar cases, set aside the ones that aren't quite right here. So this is not an issue of your being a student, you know, considering government scholarships. And, you know, I'm fine with young people, for the most part, taking government scholarships. Their parents are paying for these programs, have been paying for them through their tax dollars and you know, you know launching your kid out in the world if there are scholarships available that's fine go ahead and uh, and take those so another uh, set aside thing is you're not a tax paying business uh, that's affected by government policies it's important if you're a nonprofit free market liberal organization. You don't pay taxes on your donations or other revenue sources. You're exempt from sales taxes. So all of the recovering tax dollars, uh, considerations that might be relevant to tax paying businesses, those are not relevant in, in this case. Also, we're, we're not uh, uh, you know near retirees or recently retired people who have been forced into uh, you know contributing to a government managed old age program. Uh, you know, I'm fine with, you know, if you've been forced to pay into a specific program that's targeted to support you later in life, well, then it's perfectly fine to withdraw funds from that program when you are eligible to take funds out that you have put into uh, during during your career. But in addition to setting aside those non-relevant cases, there is a particularizing element, one further, that I do want, to, that I do think is directly relevant, and I do want to highlight it in framing my approach to the discussion here. It's also the case that even if you're a free market or Sorry, if you're a nonprofit organization, you're not a standard nonprofit organization, say like the Red Cross, right, or some other organization that's uh, you know, devoted to, I don't know, uh, you know, cleaning up the trash that gets spilled uh, uh, along the highway outside your town. Instead, you're an organization that does have a particular position on political philosophy and the proper role in a free society. So you're not only, right, not a taxpaying business, but you are also not just another nonprofit organization out there. You are a mission driven organization and that is that is important here. So accordingly when I'm considering you know the, the PPP program, I want us to think of it as our decision making role, as in some sense we're we're contributing to the making a decision, we're a leader, but within a nonprofit organization that has a mission, and that mission is to advocate and model 
the principles of a free society. So, you know, I'm just an academic, right, uh, and so forth, but I will imagine that I'm, say, the CEO of such an organization. The decision that I'm facing is, you know, should I say yes or no, should we in this organization participate in government programs like the PPP? Out there, there are four arguments, uh, broad arguments that have been made for taking PPP. One is quite general, say, you know, we do live in this corrupted mixed economy from which all sorts of things have been taken from us. So if government money has uh, become available, just go ahead and take it. A second is that we uh, pay taxes. So if you can get some of that back, those tax dollars back in this particular form, go ahead and take take it. A third argument has been that recent government actions have damaged us in our activities. So if the government's offering some form of restitution or compensation, go ahead and take it uh, in this particular context. Or a fourth narrower is to say that, well, you know, we do have some payroll taxes and other withholdings that our employees are taking. So we're just going to take the PPP money and apply it to the payroll taxes and other related withholdings. Now, I do think that, you know, except for the tax his argument, which doesn't apply to nonprofit organizations, the other three arguments do have some traction. That's fine. They're worth mentioning, but they are not complete as they focus really just on one type of justice consideration, that is to say, getting money back, either you know, getting money back from uh, takings or lost earnings or, or something like that. So going back to the point about mixed economies and putting different principles in tension, I think there are at least three major principles involved that free market liberal organizations of this sort need to consider. Justice certainly is one, but integrity is another, and productiveness is also uh, an important one. And each of those require some special detailing for this particular case. And I don't think it's enough to say, hey, it's a matter of justice and, uh, you know, we have been treated unjustly in some form or other. And so taking the money under the PPP is a form of compensation. And why I don't think it's justice alone is that's much too abstract. And it's not always the case that justice is the only consideration in particularly in, in this situation. So, for example, take a, a non-monetary example that involves justice, but suppose you're, you're, you're at a bar with some friends uh, and you're, you've gone there for a drink, but for whatever reason, you've just been unjustly smacked up, up, upside the head by some aggressive person, you know, a mildly drunk person, but that person is still, you know, confronting you and is in a kind of threatening stance. Now, one is perfectly justified in striking back, right? You do have the right of self-defense, you have been damaged, and so forth. So as a justice issue, general principle, you are within your justice rights to strike back. But it does not follow from that alone that you should strike back, or even that justice requires that you strike back. It could be, for example, that you have, will decide to avoid the person as being beneath your dignity to engage. It's just some drunk guy, right, who got out of hand. You might say, I've got better things to do with my time than to get into a bar fight, so I'm going to just defuse the situation and walk away. You can and might properly consider, I don't want to risk dim damaging, you know, this nice new clothing outfit that I'm in love with and I really like the look of it and would likely get damaged. I have better things to do, like enjoying the evening with my friends. And if I can diffuse this and just walk away, that might very well be the best option. So justice is an operative principle. You do have a justice claim, but it is not sufficient to say, to just to say what the right thing to do in that situation. You have no obligation to strike the guy. You're not necessarily a martyr for not doing so. You're not necessarily a coward for doing so. In fact, it could be part of just being the bigger man or being the bigger person just to let it go. It's a judgment call depending in part on highly personalized values. So beware of mechanically applying a very general principle like justice. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead and his provocative account of master and slave moralities and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claim that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so, or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? 
Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy to understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously, and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis, and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Another way in which justice is operative but is in tension with another principle is what I think of the tainted process principle, where there are in many cases where you are entitled to take something, but how it gets to you is some sort of inappropriate process that is tainted and so you don't want to participate. So, you know, as some examples, I mean, suppose you're a woman and a man has just proposed marriage to you. He presents you with a diamond engagement ring and it's beautiful and sparkling, but you know that he was married once before, and you recognize the engagement ring he's now presenting to you. It's the same ring that he gave to that earlier woman. And that bothers you, right? You want a ring, but you don't want that ring. Yes, of course, you know, he earned the money that paid for the ring. Yes, he bought it himself. Yes, uh, it's justly in his possession, and he has every right to do with it what he wants. So there is no injustice involved, but the history path matters, how that ring came to you and what, what, uh, what, uh, what history, so to speak, that ring has lived. And how much that matters is an individualized judgment call. And you as the woman, you might be perfectly fine with it. Maybe you know their marriage ended very quickly. It was just a youthful mistake on, on both of their parts. She quickly returned the ring to him. It's been sitting in a drawer. Now he's desperately in love with you. Maybe he doesn't have a huge amount of money to go out and buy another diamond ring. You like the look of it. So you're perfectly fine with taking it. So how you deal with the, in this case, you know, tainted process or history of the ring, it could be that you don't want that particular ring at all because of how it came to you. Uh, on the other hand, you might be perfectly fine. And, and of course, there's a sliding scale from the engagement ring. I mean, suppose he's currently living in a home, but he was living in that home with, with, the, with the other woman. And are you comfortable with, with moving into that home? Or are you going to say, no, that home is tainted now, we want to move to another place? Are you going to use the dinner dishes that he and she bought together, or are you going to throw them away and buy brand new dinner dishes? So an abstract appeal to just possession or just entitlement or property rights and so forth is not sufficient, right? How that particular piece of property, even if it is justly held and coming to you, is not sufficient. You need to take into account the history. And so how PPP funding is coming to you, what process is the government engaging in, that can matter a lot to people. The fact that you might have a claim on some PPP funds is not sufficient. Now, another I got a more symbolic uh, example, uh, just to kind of exaggerate this point. This is a silly but fun example. I think of it as the, the Hitler's pillow example, and I, I made it up all by myself. But it does involve a, a, uh, this issue of justice in the abstract versus justice in the in the particular. You know, suppose back in the war, you know, your home had been commandeered by uh, Adolf Hitler and his uh, invading army, and Hitler slept in your home using your embroidered pillow right for a few nights and he really liked the soft comfort of your pillow so when they moved on he took the pillow with him but at the war's end all of the stuff that hitler and his army confiscated they are gathered up and they're being returned to their owners now you certainly have a just claim to that 
pillow. I mean, it even has your name embroidered on it. But would you claim that pillow and would you use that pillow again? Or would you take it outside, douse it with gasoline and burn it to ashes? Now, the point is you have a justice claim. That is your pillow. You'd be perfectly entitled to take it. But whether it's right for you to take that particular pillow is a highly individualized judgment call. So even if you have a justice claim of some sort to government money, that money has a history. In many cases, it has a tainted history. And whether the taint is too much is an individual judgment call. So for you to decide that it's right for you and for your organization, it does require additional personal evaluative factors. Now, a third factor is, uh, a third principle rather, is that uh, justice, yes, is involved, but I think also the principle of productivity and uh, being committed to the virtue of productiveness has a special heightened role for free market liberal organizations. I mean, it should have a, a heightened role for all of us, but especially for organizations. Part of that philosophical package is about self-responsibility, being a self-made person to a fault of only wanting to have in one possession what one has earned by one's own efforts. And part of your integrity then is taking pride in the earned and to avoiding the unearned and avoiding anything that involves any sort of a wrong taking from other people. Now, obviously, in a mixed economy, that is very difficult to pull off. But as a heightened principle, you are are especially sensitive to it. So, uh, you know, I sometimes think of a sports analogy here. Uh, you know, you, you play sports, you want to, to win, but you also want to win fairly according to the rules and to be, you know, every point that you score is a matter of your skill in, in, in that competitive situation. But you know, uh, in a particular game, say, that the referee has made mistakes and perhaps the referee is biased. And so as a result, your competitor has gotten some points that he probably didn't deserve or maybe even definitely did not deserve. So Suppose, you know, the ref pulls you aside at one point and said, you know, he's had, he's had a change of heart and he offers you, you know, to give you some extra points you know, to go over to the score table and have some extra points put up on, on, on the scoreboard for you. Would you accept those points under those circumstances? You kind of have a kind of justice claim as a restitution for the earlier mistakes that the referee made. You know, or suppose you step outside the line in the course of scoring and, you know, technically that score should not count, but the ref didn't see it. Would you uh, be happy with, strictly speaking, you haven't earned that point and it would involve another mistake or involving a further corruption of the refereeing process, you know, go along with evening the scales of justice in this particular case. Now, what we sorry, what often say is, you know, to the extent uh, you think about your mission. Why are you playing sports? If you are highly committed to the idea that I want to win only by points that I have scored according to the rules, and it really doesn't matter if the other person is cheating a little bit, or and I'm going into the game knowing that sometimes referees are going to make mistakes, and sometimes even referees are going to be biased, but that's part of the game as a matter of my commitment to a certain kind of sports ethics. I'm not going to accept the imperfect restitution. I'm going to take pride in the, in the only earned. But then, of course, you might then say, I'm fine with the imperfect restitution in some circumstances. And that, again, does depend on your personal scale of values. Why are you playing sports in the first point. So the point of these three examples is to say that yes, justice claims are involved here, but having a justice claim is at most a necessary but not a sufficient uh, uh, part of the decision-making process. You're listening to Open College on the Possibly Correct Network with renowned philosopher and author Dr. Stephen Hicks. Stay up to date with the latest releases and news from Dr. Hicks by following the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Minds.com and Gab or sign up to our email list at www.opencollegepodcast.com. While you're online, please show your support for the podcast by leaving a view on your chosen media player. You can check out all our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com. Now back to the podcast. 
want to turn to uh, some other principles that I think uh, I've not yet seen in the discussions uh, mentioned. So I want to uh, to put them out there and highlight them because in my thinking, these are the ones that are, are actually most important for mission-driven organizations, especially these two principles. One is a principle of branding, that as an organization, you know, part of your organizational management is paying very careful attention to your brand. Your brand has market value. It has a huge amount of symbolic value inside and outside of your organization. And obviously, this will all be uh, thinking coming back to, to PPP. But think of some important branding examples where people are would be justified in an abstract sense in acting a certain way, but it would be deathly to their brand. So one example I think of is uh, Sam Walton before he died. He's the guy who built up Walmart and became uh, you know, a multimillionaire at least uh, as a result of basic goods, low prices uh, for ordinary people and particularly people uh, initially out in rural areas uh, who are very, you know, uh, people without pretensions and in many cases limited budgets and so forth. And Sam Walton and recognized that he was partly, you know, that kind of a guy himself who had built himself up from humble beginnings, but that the organization he had created was committed to a certain kind of retailing, and that he, as the entrepreneur who had built it up and was still the leader of this organization, has a symbolic role. So it's partly his personal identity. Yeah, he's a guy who prefers to drive a pickup truck and work a day clothes and a baseball cap as he's going about his business. But he also, even when he became a rich guy, made sure that he, when he showed up at his favorite, at his source, you know, he's going to do inspections, make suggestions for improvements, right, and so forth, that he fits who he is and what the image and branding of Walmart is. So, you know, he's a rich guy. He could very well decide, hey, uh, now I'm going to buy a shiny Cadillac limousine, I'm going to get a chauffeur, I'm going to wear a print stripe three-piece suit, and then I'm I'm going to go on my rounds of my stores and do inspection and making suggestions. But that would be a huge branding clash. He is Walmart. He embodies it. He models it, especially on the job. And he has to pay a special attention that he doesn't do anything that conflicts with that brand. Now, by contrast, a fictional example, suppose you are an actress who plays, you know, on a wildly popular you know, television show, a, a very elegant but slightly snobbish character, and you have, you know, millions of fans everywhere you go, paparazzi are following you around constantly, uh, taking your picture, and you end up in all of the magazines and, and so forth. Now, on an off day, you know, would that actress, you know, pop into Walmart, you know, to pick up a few things, and would she go to Walmart just, you know, wearing whatever she happened to have thrown on that morning? And the answer is, of course, no. She would be very attentive to her brand when she goes out, how she dresses, and, of course, what store she shops. Now, she, you know, it's perfectly justified, perfectly free for her to shop wherever she wants and wear whatever she wants, but she, as a professional actress, has a branding issue that is central to her career. Another example, uh, to think of Michael Jordan from some years ago. Uh, yeah, he's a, a kind of you know, an awesome athlete, but also he embodied for millions, uh, if not billions, of people around the world what it was to be a healthy athlete, committed to clean living, a fierce but fair competitor, and he became a hero and a role model, and as part of his profession, embraced that as his brand. Now, it turns out that Michael Jordan likes to smoke cigars, he likes to gamble, uh, and you know, apparently he would gamble in amounts that would make you or I uh, very nervous, but you know, given the income he was making, it, it was manageable. But the point is that the cigars and the gambling are intention or conflict, right, with his professional brand as a clean living, healthy athlete type of person. And the point is not that those things are unjustified, and so we can't make a justice claim, hey, you know, you know, it's my money, I can spend it however I want. It's not a general appeal to liberty. I live in a free country and I should be able to do. He's perfectly free and justified and relaxing however he sees fit. 
but he is making a branding commitment within a narrower context right of choices that he freely made and the same thing is going to apply to free market liberal organizations right yes you're free to be whatever kind of organization you are yes you're justified in behaving a certain way but if you have made a set of choices and you are cultivating a brand and you've committed to a brand then you do have an obligation to stick with those choices as well as to live up to the expectations that you have led others to be justified in making about you. Another example, perhaps closer to home, uh, not Sam Walton, not an actress, not Michael Jordan, but I'm thinking of higher education institutions and uh, in particular Hillsdale College in Michigan, which is uh, famous for being a mission-driven college. Of course, there are many mission-driven colleges, but it's famous for being one that is committed to private enterprise and private education. And so it accepts absolutely no government money as a matter of principle. And it has made that a, a, a part of its mission, its mission statement, and part of its public brand. And so as a result of that, given the many you know, funding temptations that are available that virtually all other colleges and universities have taken, Hillsdale College made a, a decision a generation or two ago that it was going to be extra entrepreneurial in fundraising so that it would be able to, to make sure that uh, the students it wanted to accept would be able to go to Hillsdale College. And it uh, decided to make that an integral part of its brand. And so it would be a terrible branding mistake for Hillsdale College to accept, say, PPP funding from the government. Even if it finds itself in an extra difficult survival circumstance, and certainly higher education is in a challenging circumstance right now, even if it can make a justificat justificatory case for taking the money, as most other colleges and universities do, it would probably, almost certainly, I can't speak for Hillsdale 100%, but it would be wrong for Hillsdale College, especially as a branding issue. I want to kind of up the stakes. Uh, you know, I think branding is important for free market liberal organizations, but there is uh, a beyond the branding issues an issue of moral integrity that is in play, in addition to the justice claims and so forth. And, uh, here's an analogy, and uh, this will be perhaps an amusing analogy, but if you think of yourself as a professional intellectual or a professional uh, advocate uh, or activist right, who's, who's uh, involved in a free market liberal organization, right, that is your mission and a certain mission is built into the organizational DNA right, of, your, of your, 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 your company. So to, uh, to, to have a stressed example here, uh, imagine it's like being a priest or a nun who has sworn chastity. Right? Yeah, chuckle right for a moment, but bear with me right on this. Now, rightly or wrongly, right, you are a priest or a nun, and part of your professional moral commitments is you are not going to engage in sex. Now, the issue is not the correctness of the position, but the kind of commitment you have made to that position. And even if, you know, you're a priest or a nun who's been sexually molested, right, uh, and certain justice claims, right, or whatever are, are, are appropriate uh, and, and so forth, that's not going to change the nature of your commitment. The thing is your vow, not what others do or what other people are doing to you. So to draw the analogy to PPP, if you are part of a free market liberal organization and you have made a vow, no government funding is appropriate, and that's a commitment that you have made organizationally, then rightly or wrongly, the issue is and what your integrity requires is a principled commitment to no government funding in the same way a priest or a nun has committed to no sex. Now, I think perhaps a better analogy 
I use the priests and the nun just to kind of highlight the level of integrity that we are going for, would be uh, perhaps the principle of confidentiality. Now, as a moral person or a normal moral person, we respect other people's confidential information. But I want to upgrade that to a professional commitment and think of it as a matter of professional ethics, as it is in the case in some professions, where there's a heightened commitment to confidentiality. Like a doctor right or a nurse or a lawyer who has taken on special professional responsibilities and has sworn an oath to say absolute confidentiality so the parallel might be you know a regular person or a regular business and uh, their relationship with respect to government funds you know compared to a person who is a professional advocate of or a philosopher of uh, a certain philosophy of government funding and maybe if you're an ordinary person there's more wiggle room with respect to government funding even if in general you're opposed to government funding but if you are a professional then you think of your professional commitment as more absolute and that language is important and how you cash out the virtue of integrity in this case becomes important detail in that professional commitment context so sometimes you know i was thinking of an analogy here suppose you know i was uh, the leader of a ppp funding and one way to test this integrity principle and i believe that i think we would be justified in taking the ppp funding and just suppose for the sake of an argument it's about five hundred thousand dollars that we are we are eligible for would i be willing in my organization to take the funding but then use that funding only for a a dedicated research fellowship and I'm going to call this research fellowship the PPP fellowship and I'm going to state in the fellowships description this position is funded by the US federal government's PPP program and then when we're trying to recruit fellows to come and, and be part of our organization and be the PPP fellows would we be fine with that or would we find that it goes against the grain of the kind of uh, in, in integrity that we want to embody as an organization? Now, I'm reminded in this point of a kind of a Steve Jobs quotation about the beauty of integrity, and he uh, puts it in more aesthetic terms, but, uh, but it's important. You know, he uses a, the analogy of a, a carpenter or a wood maker, and he's making, you know, says, you want to make beautiful, beautiful furniture, and the way he puts it is, is this. When you're a carpenter, making a beautiful chest of drawers. You're not going to use a piece of plywood on the back, right? Even though it faces the wall and nobody will ever see it, you'll know it's there. So you're going to use a beautiful piece of wood on the back for you to sleep well at night. The aesthetic, the equality has to be carried all the way through. Unquote. So the question then is, you know, is taking PPP into your organization like using that piece of cheaper plywood on the back or not? And that's the integrity test. So that needs to be thought of explicitly and in tension with, I think, the justice principle, even if you think you're entitled to take the money. We all know what true crime is, but what about untrue crime? These are the true stories of alleged crimes which turned out to not have happened at all. The true stories of innocent people whose lives have been ripped apart and who have not been allowed to tell their stories until now. Listen to Untrue Crime on the Possibly Correct Network as Diana Davison sheds light onto cases where reputations have been ruined, careers have been destroyed and countless lies have been told. Find out what really happens when the finger of blame points to someone who's innocent. Subscribe to the Untrue Crime Podcast by going to www.untruecrimepodcast.com. You can check out all of our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com. Now back to the podcast. Now, I do think in addition to justice, in addition to the branding issues, in addition to the point about integrity and detailing that, there is another moral principle that is in play, and that is the, the principle of productiveness in general. 
But then it's very close uh, application for advocates of free market liberalism, a principle I, I think of as entrepreneurism, that a huge part of promoting a free society is encouraging people to see themselves as the entrepreneurs of their own life, kind of a robust, take charge, self-responsible, make your own way in the world, be committed to uh, producing all of the values, but also being agile, being resourceful, being entrepreneurial, innovative, and that whole complex of notions. That part of your mission as an organization in this ideological landscape is pushing those values and virtues very hard. So think of another kind of government program in this context. And suppose it's uh, unemployment be benefits. And suppose you know, you've been paying your unemployment insurance, and so you're eligible for unemployment benefits. And you've paid into the, into the program, but you lose your job. The question is going to be not that you're unjustified in taking the unemployment program, that payment, that, that, that's fine. You are justified, I think, in that circumstance in taking unemployment payments. But there is an issue about your personal value commitments to entrepreneurism. And the question then is, okay, I've lost this job, but can I find another job? Can I, if I'm finding it difficult to, uh, to find a job that I've been doing, retrain myself or pivot in another direction, pick up some new skills? Because while I would be justified in taking the unemployment payment, I am so strongly committed to always earning and always working and entrepreneurial and seeing that really as a very last ditch effort that I might take if I'm extremely desperate. But if there is any way that I can be entrepreneurial and earn my own way out, I am going to take that first. So the question then would be for free market liberal organizations is, yes, you go through challenging times, and yes, maybe the government is substantially at fault, right, or involved in your difficulties, right, and so forth. But the question you have to put to yourself is, did I have backup plans in pace? So it's something like this, because uh, I know there's ups and downs that are going to occur and emergencies and unpredictabilities. For the various, uh, you know, events that I had planned for the future, did I have contract provisions for acts of gods and so forth? Did I have insurance in place? Given that I am in this circumstance, can I be innovative in various ways? Can I scale back and do all of the things that ordinary business? And so the way is that I'm thinking is in terms of an entrepreneurial approach and modeling that entrepreneurial principle in how I'm dealing even with this government-caused set of obstacles and problems. So you're functioning like a normal business but as, again, especially as a teaching and advocacy organization, part of what we're committed to is modeling resilience and modeling entrepreneurism. And we want to make sure that there's no hint of inside of our organization or out, well, we couldn't handle the situation or we couldn't navel this, navigate rather this complicated operational train terrain. So we're you know, kind of accepting this government assistance in order to keep it going. So yes, there is a justice claim, but that is intention with, uh, we will always solve our problems ourselves, damn it, principle. And that needs to be worked out explicitly and in some detail before deciding. So in closing, what I would offer, and this was in my own thinking, is uh, on all of these principles and applications, a nine-point checklist that I think any leader or decider or even just a general person making up their mind about this issue would need to work through. Some of these, I think, are knowable from the outside, but I think also some of them are knowable only to the decision makers themselves uh, from the inside. So be very careful that when you are making a judgment call about an organization or another individual, that uh, uh, you are folding in to your evaluation of their decision, how much you know about, the, in some cases, legitimately individualized and inside the organization. Uh, information uh, that, that would need to be made. So here's the nine point checklist, right? So should I take PPP, yes or no, right? First, what is my organization's mission? And I'm thinking if you're a free market liberal organization, you say something like to advocate freedom, property rights, justice, integrity, entrepreneurism, and a principled rejection of government activity beyond very precisely specified limits. Second, 
What in practice does modeling that in our organization mean? That is to say, it's not just that we are articulating a sense of principles, but we are living it, we are embodying it, we are modeling it in the organization. Third, does my organization's founding mission statement have words to the effect that we will neither accept nor pursue government funding. Many free market liberal organizations at their founding have that in their Articles of Confederation, right, so to speak. And so there might be a constitutional issue that you should double check on, and if so, then that was going to eliminate, right, as a matter of principle. Or is your organization found founding mission statement more general? Does it give you some wiggle room uh, and so forth? A fourth question, why did I join this organization? And people vary within organizations uh, in terms of their ideological commitment. Uh, Some are more professionals with a a more general ideological commitment. For some, the ideological commitment is much more heightened, and that is uh, primary why they're there. What does my commitment to its limited government philosophy mean to me in particular? And this is uh, one of the ones where I think uh, inside the organization knowledge uh, uh, is extraordinarily important, uh, particularly for nonprofit organizations that are always struggling with budget issues. Suppose I'm the head budget manager. How much does the challenge of covering payroll and other costs map onto my justifications for taking government offered funding? And this is a gut check. I mean, suppose I'm you know, the CEO of a classical liberal organization, but the year before COVID-19 you know, there was big budget troubles, and maybe I lost a major donor or two. So you know, I'm looking at a million, million dollar budget contraction or some sort of a shortfall. You know, I've started laying off people. I'm scaling back their hours. This is a this is a tough year for me. And then along comes COVID nineteen, and oh man! And then the PP funds are offered by the government. I could get, say, again, just a half a million dollars. Now, that's going to be a temptation for anyone. Now, would I be tempted if I hadn't lost the donors or if it was a non, a normal kind of non-COVID-19 kind of year? How principled or desperation-driven is my decision-making? And again, that's an inside the individual decision-making that no one from the outside is going to know. And it's obviously a sensitive one. Another one, this is point six on my checklist, in challenging times, have I functioned as an agile, innovative entrepreneur? And if uh, I'm an intellectual and advocacy organization, have I really tried to pivot online or cultivate other media, bring in new funding sources and so forth? Am I really going out of my way to be agile and innovative, right? Uh, And again, that's going to be something that only I will know. Have I done my best effort and so on? Seventh on my checklist is have I consulted all of our major constituents, right? The board, the donors, and my employees. Are they all good with it? Particularly in a mission-driven organization, it's important that we have those kinds of discussions explicitly. I suppose, you know, you're taking the, you are, as the leader, you're considering taking the PPP money. And so you're talking it over with your board. And some people on your board are kind of uncomfortable with taking the government money. So you run the just, you know, the usual arguments, you know, it's a matter of justice, etc. But, you know, they're not quite on board and are still uncomfortable. Now, suppose there are two of them who are on the board and they're very rich and they say, okay, look, we know it's a half a million dollars. So what we will do is we will increase our donations to cover that amount. So take the additional half million dollars from us, but don't take the government PPP money. Would you take their offer? Or would you say, uh, sorry, uh, I think this is a matter of justice. My intellectual advisors have said it's a matter of justice that we take the government PP funding. So thank you, but no thank you to your half million dollar donation on that in that context, because it is a matter of justice principle. So again, use that as a test case for uh, the competing principles in, in place. But make sure, of course, within the organization that everybody is, is on board. 
eighth point, looking outside the organization to our national and worldwide markets. Uh, have I considered the branding costs? And branding costs can be considerable. Of course, some of the criticism is going to come from our intellectual enemies, and there's going to be a lot of unfair sniping. But a certain amount of the criticism is going to be come from those who are genuinely surprised and disappointed given our branding and given their understanding of what our mission is all about. There will be branding costs, and those will be real costs. Some of them will be potential donors and consumers. Have I carefully estimated that branding risk? And if our working example is a half a million dollars, is that worth a half a million dollars. And then finally, uh, ninth on my checklist is to ask, what are the risks that in, say, five years, right, some future government will say to you or me at my organization, you took uh, PPP funding, so now you must accept this further regulation. The thin edge of the wedge, right, or to use an old Arab warning that I love, right, the camel's nose is under the edge of the tent, right? There you are in your tent. The camels are supposed to be outside, but the camel smells something it like, and it sticks its nose just under the edge of the tent. At that point, you have to stop the camel from advancing any further, or pretty soon its head is under the tent, then its shoulders, and then pretty soon you're in this tent with a big old smelly camel. So, in this case, the thin edge of the web, wed, thin edge of the wedge, rather, is uh, this government one-time PPP funding. But as we know, there are slippery slopes, and governments are very much in favor of going down those slippery slopes as much as possible. Uh, and once we step off the principled and onto to the slope, can we stop the slide? And so here, uh, you know, coming from a higher education context, uh, I think any organization would have to take much stock in the example of the many nonprofit, mission-driven colleges and universities that accepted federal funds 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, and now are up to their eyeballs with federal rules and compliance officers and more. That's another risk that needs to be carefully discussed and carefully calculated. Now, my ultimate conclusion is this. At the level of general principles, I would say don't take the money. But, and this is important, not every organization is in the same circumstances or has the same scale of values. And it is true that in a mixed economy, trade-offs are inevitable and governments do act badly and damage us. So I will not say that taking the money is necessarily a failure of integrity. It could be, of course, but that would require much particularized inside knowledge. You're listening to Open College on the Possibly Correct Network with renowned philosopher and author Dr. Stephen Hicks. Stay up to date with the latest releases and news from Dr. Hicks by following the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Minds.com and Gab or sign up to our email list at www.opencollegepodcast.com. While you're online, please show your support for the podcast by leaving a view on your chosen media player. You can check out all our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com. Minds.com.